Hey guys, uh, my name is Howard and I'm the head engineer here at Sigma. Uh, we make some pretty nice motion systems uh, for racing simulators and um, everything is made right here completely in-house in our facility in Pomona, California. Uh, we're pretty proud of them. But um, yeah, today we want to talk about different motion systems, uh, their weight capacities and, and how to compare them. There's so many out there, so many specs. Like for example, if uh, company A's actuator can lift 500 pounds and company B claims that their actuators can lift 600 pounds, does that really mean that the latter is better? Um, so yeah, let's um, go for a quick dive into the world of actuators and um, yeah, and compare them. Okay, first and foremost, I think it's important to note that no matter how much spec we throw at an actuator, a lot of torque, super fast. Uh, none of that matters if our motion algorithm sucks. Right? So it's kind of like be given a really expensive guitar, has all the right specs and sounds amazing, but not knowing how to, to play it. So, um, so that's that's obvious. But uh, let's uh, jump right into this uh, Technic electric servo motor page. This is the one that we're using on the DK2 system. Uh, and the most important spec that we're going to be looking at here is the uh, the constant torque. Now, this spec is often often referred to as the, the RMS torque, constant torque, stall torque, or rated torque. Uh, and what this means is that uh, for this particular motor, and that's 0.9 newton meter, it means that this motor can provide this amount of torque, 0.9 newton meter, indefinitely, forever and ever, without having it suffer from any electrical repercussions like things heating up to an unreasonable amount or um, basically that's it has a, a very healthy amount of safety margin built in built inside uh, so that they the company this electric motor manufacturer are comfortable uh, with its customers and users uh, producing this much torque um, all the time with 100% duty cycle you know something worth pointing out is the peak torque value I've seen companies that claim their actuators or servo motors could produce this much torque, which is obviously much, much higher than than this. That's in a magnitude of four times, and some of them even, even higher. Now, uh, this is the absolute peak torque that this motor could provide, but it does not mean that it's uh, very useful information because if you look at this graph here, um, you'll learn that electric motors produce the most amount of torque when the RPM is essentially zero, when it's not moving. Uh, and the available torque that it could produce quickly drops off as the RPM climbs. As you can see, uh, this is a pretty well-performing motor uh, with it still producing a healthy amount of torque at 500 RPM, but then it quickly drops off um, as it goes higher and higher and higher. So, uh, and not only that, this uh, peak torque is just by looking at this value you don't really know you can't tell how for how long this peak torque is available to you for. like it could be just a fraction of a second or it could be um, one or two or three seconds long you don't really know and it's just not very practical to use this value at all uh, when you're taking calculating and taking into consideration the design of your uh, motion system or actuators now, finally, we're going to look at the uh, the max speed or the rated speed uh, of the, the servo motor, and this one being at 2,500 RPM. That's important to know. Uh, we're going to need that for calculations later on. Okay. Uh, next, let's uh, take a look at the ball screw. This is what we're using on the DK2, and uh, what we want to know is the lead, which is uh, how much the ball net advances uh, for every one revolution of the ball screw. So for this particular one, every time the ball screw completes a 360 degree or one, one revolution, the ball nut advances roughly five millimeters. So we're gonna take that as the lead or the pitch of the screw and enter that into our calculation. Okay, so we're gonna use a simple little formula here. As you can see, as the servo motor spins, the ball screw also spins, which pushes the uh, ball nut. Uh, that carries the piston, moves it in and out of the actuator. So it's really simple in principle. And the formula here 
Uh, it's really simple. We're just going to go through each of the variables. So T here, as indicated, is the driving torque. And we're going to take uh, the constant torque of 0 0.9 newton meter. Punch that in. The lead of our ball screw, as indicated also, is uh, roughly 5 millimeter. So let's put that in. The N is the efficiency. Uh, for a ball screw ball nut combination, the efficiency is easily north of 95%. Um, but for the purpose of um, comparing, we can use um, anything really, as long as you keep the same efficiency between all the competitors, if you will. So for our purposes, just use 0 0.9 with a little bit of a safety of margin built in. And finally, to get the force, we just have to rearrange the formula a little bit. So to do that, let's take the torque here, multiply it by 2 pi n, so 2 times pi times n, which is the efficiency, and divide that by the lead, which is in millimeters. So we've got to be careful. Uh, let's do that, divide it by 5 and divide the 5 by another 1,000 to convert it into meters. So with that, we're using all the same units. And we're going to get the, the answer in uh, newtons, so it's roughly 1,000 newtons. And to get the kilogram for it, we have to, to divide the newtons, this value, by 9.8. And that will give us uh, 9.8. That'll give us 104 kilos, and if we multiply this by 2.2, we'll get the weight in pounds. Now this is per actuator. Now the 229 pounds we've just calculated uh, is what this keep, actuator is capable of holding uh, indefinitely forever, but in, it also means that the actuator is not really doing anything, it's not moving at all, which completely defeats the purpose. So uh, through a lot of testing and experimenting, uh, we found that by, uh, by by reducing this amount, by applying a 55% roughly uh, margin of safety to this, and um, it, it would give a really, really realistic value of, of um, something that we can actually use. So if we multiply this value by 55%, we reduce it down to 57 kilo or 126 pounds. And that's how we came up with uh, the weight capacity for the DK2. So for a, uh, the, again, this is one single actuator. So if you want to calculate the three actuator uh, system for the DK2, you multiply this by three. And you'll find that you can carry up to 370, say 375 pounds. And for the four actuator system, you multiply that by four. And you'll see that it can carry up to 500 pounds. Now the RPM. Right here, it's uh, 2,520, 25, 20, okay? And uh, so the actuator speed, in this case, to calculate that, uh, we're going to take the RPM, which is in revolutions per minute, and we know that for every revolution, it will advance by 5 millimeter. And we're going to divide that by... Well, actually, no, you know, we can, we can skip that. Yeah, so five, millimeter, uh, five millimeters, and we're going to divide it by 60 seconds in a minute. So we're looking at about 210 millimeters per second, or if we divide this by 25.4, uh, we can get, what did I do here? Divide this by 25.4, uh, we get 8.2 inches per second. Okay, so that's another useful spec that we can uh, compare with. Sorry, just a quick note on the 55% safety margin. Uh, this is what we found um, through literally thousands and thousands of hours of testing to be a good number for the DK2. Uh, we have a very unique, very lively, a very responsive motion system, and our taste for motion is considered to be very demanding. So. Um, and the proof for this is that our customers typically run our motion system sliders at like 2 or 3 out of 10. Uh, so, you know, like uh, other motion systems are probably not as aggressive. Uh, we don't know for sure. 
um, they're probably not as aggressively tuned compared to ours. Um, so the safety margin could be much higher for them. Um, but as, as you'll see later, we're going to be comparing the DKG with a couple of other systems on the market. So regardless of the safety percentage, um, it, it makes sense to keep them at all at the same value so we can compare apples to apples. Okay, and here's a summary of our analysis. And here you can see, of course, we have the DK2, uh, the rate of torque and the lead are what we expect them to be. And of course, we calculated the weight capacity of the actuator um, each to be 126 pounds. And of course, that's what we claimed uh, the actuators could do. And we've actually recently launched the DK2 Plus system, which I honestly think is, is pretty sexy looking, but I'm, I'm honestly pretty, obviously pretty biased. Uh, here you can see that it's a large, much larger motor. It's designed for um, game centers or other commercial commercial settings where the rigs are typically uh, much heavier than what we have at home. So uh, we can go into some calculations. Uh, we found the the weight capacity of the actuators to be about 200 pounds, and of course that's what we claim. Now I'm going to bring two other actuator offerings from. Uh, two other companies. I'm not going to disclose who they are, but uh, what's interesting to see here is that these are bigger actuators. You can see that here from the rate of torque. Uh, similar lead, but uh, the offering from company A um, was claimed to be able to lift 500 pounds when after going through the same calculation, it can only lift 350. Uh, 350. Whereas uh, company B they could uh, lift about 366 when the company claims that it could lift 350. So they are under-reporting. So this would be obviously a great choice uh, if you're looking to get um, a system that can lift even more than what the DK2 and 2 Plus could, uh, could offer. So that's it, guys. I hope this gives you an idea of how we come up with the weight capacity of our actuators. And unfortunately, if you do wish to evaluate other motion systems, you will, at the minimum, uh, need, need the specs of the motors and the ball screws that they use, which may be hard to find sometimes, but in this day and age, I'm pretty sure you can find just about anything if you try hard enough. Um, and, and of course, as a motion builder, we do have to consider a lot of other things um, besides the calculations that we just went through. Uh, for example, like the mechanical system needs to be, like the, like the actuator itself needs to be really, really strong, really uh, precisely built um, and manufactured. And the electrical system needs to be able to support the force uh, that the servo system is, is outputting right all the time. And uh, of course, finally, the most important is the, uh, the software. Um, and the motion algorithm, which is really the brain behind behind be behind it all. So um, yeah, um, that's that's about it. I hope this gives you an idea of how to uh, go around and compare different motion systems through uh, a more analytical process. And ultimately, I hope that this will help you uh, make the right decision for your racing simulator. Cheers.